finding ourselves, discovering ourselves in the very place where he found us first. Lost we were but found in him. And found co-seated. co-embraced. What I love about this gospel is how equally included and equally valued every single person on this planet is. And in the context of what Jesus said when he declared that you are the light of the world, imagine his confidence to see his life beam from your eyes. And if Paul <coughs> could dare say in Ephesians 4 and verse 7 that grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of the gift of Christ, then we have nothing else to boast in. But in that same grace reflected in one another's eyes, in one another's faces, in our presence. I'm so, I so thank God for tangible presence. <laughs> this is not a make-believe moment, although we've anticipated and counted down the days and in the hour to be here, to be in one another's presence. I thank God that Jesus has elevated us to a place where we are so much more than audience. That we're participating in the very, very heartbeat of the Father and the Son and the Spirit's fellowship. We're not here to invent a program of fellowship, but we simply respond to an invitation to the fellowship of the ages, to the place where we most belong. We travel a bit, you know, and um, we get to meet people in different places on this planet and participate in different cultural and historic references and language groups. But I thank God for the common ground where every person on this planet discovers themselves to be equally valued and equally embraced. So we are just going to feast this weekend in what he declares us to be. We're not here to add our guests to possibilities in man's search for a new philosophical thought that could possibly define God. But we are defined in him. The express image is Hebrews chapter 1 of his likeness it didn't leave any gray areas the shadow language became substance in the incarnation and incarnation is so flesh and blood <laughs> it's so present in you our ministry is to celebrate him in one another it gives context to fellowship in Philemon in verse 6, Paul makes one of perhaps one of the most profound statements in, 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 his, in, his, in his writings when he says that the koinonia of our faith, the celebration, the koinonia, the participation, is the sound okay? Must I do something to make the... I can take it off and just talk. <laughs> when recording, Hello, Caleb. The, the koinonia of your faith is energeo, says the Greek. It, that's where we get our word energy from. It is triggered into action. It is ignited through the acknowledging, the epignosca, of what? Of every good thing that is in us. <laughs> and how do we know it's there? Because he says it is in Christ. So mirrored in Him, we discover every good thing that is in us to begin with. We have wasted so much time trying to get there, when there is where we are to begin with. Mirrored in Him. He did not come as an example for us, but of us. When John celebrates Him in 1 John 2, and I just translated it the other day, um, in the mirror as well, 1 John 2. And verse 7, let me just read it to you, just these two verses. My beloved family, I know that the words I write to you here may not immediately remind you of Moses. This does not mean that it's a new doctrine. 
It is the ancient conversation that echoes God's voice prophetically. It is indeed the very conclusion of the word which you have heard from the beginning. <laughs> Thank God for a modern age where we can do all kinds of stuff that, that our previous generations could not participate in. But we are equally participating in the conversation of the ages. In the beginning, reflects John, when he's now almost, or perhaps more than 90 years old, he has a reference that eclipses. You know, what Matthew saw in terms of the genealogy of Jesus and trying to get it back to Abraham and, and, and Luke taking us beyond Abraham to Adam, the son of God. And, and John says, but in the beginning was the word. And so we have a conversation. We're tapping into a communication that has always been. And so he said, it's the very word that you've heard from the beginning. And then in verse 2, verse 8, he says this. He says, and yet it is a gloriously new message that I'm writing to you. Remember what he said in chapter 1 verse 4, I'm writing to you. Imagine an illiterate John at the age of 80, 90. No longer finding an excuse to remain illiterate, you know. Re leave it to the next generation. He became absolutely with one passion. He says, I'm writing this so that your joy may be complete. Because this fellowship equally belongs to you. He says, it's a glory uh, uh, that I'm writing to you. You may ask, how can that which is old also be new? Herein is the secret of its newness. Whatever is true of Jesus is equally true of you. Amen. Can you imagine a statement like that? <laughs> it just cancels every excuse we could ever have to just the audience to another great, you know, perhaps gifted speaker. <laughs> we are just participating in a conversation that has always been. And its newness is found. In something that ignites within our hearts. The word is near unto you. <laughs> if what we say does not happen according to Luke 24, that a, a, a mere reference to Scripture ignites hearts. Because of its newness. That that which is true of Him is equally true of me. And if grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of the gift of Christ then it's going to take an eternity for us to continue to explore the dimensions of the fellowship yeah. of the Father, Son and Spirit with us right in the middle of it yeah. you're not standing on the fringes you see our unbelief or our in, uh, indifference does not locate us That's right. we are located in Christ to be eternally seated together with Him in heavenly places. Amen. When John declares the conclusion of Jesus' ministry, he says, in that day you will know that I am in my Father. You will no longer pick up stones when I declare that I and the Father are one. Why? Because you'll discover yourself there. <laughs> Jesus wasn't coming to brag about some secret fellowship that He and the Father and the Spirit enjoyed that excludes us. He came to unveil what we've excluded ourselves from for years and generations of unbelief, believing a lie about ourselves, hiding in Eden from the very fellowship that we designed for. And He has come <laughs> to seek and to save. And He gives us an indication in Luke 15, in all three of those parables of how determined He is to find. I'm so glad that the finding is not measured by our determination to seek Him. He says in Isaiah 65, one before you sought me, I was ready to be found by you. And you can go and read this in any translation. He repeats this sentence. He says, I said, here I am. Why would he repeat it? Because mirror speaks in repeat language. Because if he said, here I am, and I said, so where are you now, Lord? You suddenly discover him unveiled in you. <laughs> God has no other agenda for planet earth but to embrace an indifferent world into a fellowship where they began. You see, we began in the most intimate thought of deity. You were not an afterthought. You were not just, well, let's just add numbers to the planet. 
Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10, 12, while we measure ourselves by ourselves and compare ourselves by one another, we miss the point. We're without understanding. 1 John 5, 20 says, we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding <coughs> to know Him who is true. And then He gives us the understanding, He says, and we are in Him who is true. Emmanuel. <laughs> he's not more Emmanuel to the Jew than what he is to the Gentile. Yeah. God cannot get any closer to you through any of your striving. So when Jesus tells us three beautiful parables, beginning with the lost sheep, imagine having a hundred sheep and you lose one. <clears throat> and sheep's not an endangered species. Definitely not in Australia and South Africa. <laughs> we do there with the sheep that you do here with the hogs. <laughs> Imagine you have a hundred, you lose one. Why is Jesus telling the story? Because he came to reveal the value of the individual. You are irreplaceable to your father. Let in are blessed with four children. And in South Africa, four is like four children. I'm so glad we didn't stop at three. I'm so glad my parents didn't stop at three. I was the fourth. <laughs> Lily was one of six sisters. Can you imagine how their parents prayed for a boy? Oh, Lord, let her be a boy. <laughs> I thank God that she's a girl. <laughs> a hundred sheep. And you lose one. And he says, the shepherd went and he sought for the one. For how long? Thank you so much. Until he said, well, you know, I've done my little bit. <laughs> I've sought you, but this stubborn old sheep doesn't want to be found. He sought until he found it. Yeah. You see, when Jesus declared on the cross, it is finished. He wouldn't say, well, let's settle for a little, a little handful, you know, of converts and blast the rest off into darkness. Found in him. And now we discover a fellowship where every good thing that is in us reflected in him ignites a new kind of a koinonia a new kind of a conversation can you imagine a conversation in society where there is no longer any gossip where you feel 100 percent protected safe in one another's conversation this can only happen with a reference that carries more weight than the gossip does. And it's exactly what Jesus Christ came to fulfill. The prophetic shadow <coughs> became substance in the man, Jesus Christ. The hidden treasure, hidden for ages and generations in the same soil, was found by man. And in order to persuade us of our original value, according to Matthew 13, 44, he hid it again. And he went away. And he sold all that he had. Not to buy you back from the devil. When does a thief ever become owner? The earth is the Lord's. Without their permission <laughs> and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell in it. So why would Jesus exchange this conversation about a man finding a treasure and seeing enough value in that treasure to hide it again and go away? 
and redeem the original value. Because he's persuading our minds. God, says Hebrews 6, 16 and 17, desiring to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose. Adam's fall was not about to persuade God to think less of his image and his likeness wrapped up in your skin. <laughs> Paul says we have this treasure in earthen vessels. And even though we've been distracted by what we are in the earthen vessel and according to the flesh, it never distracts God. <laughs> he never sees you differently. If He loved us while we were at our worst, He doesn't love us differently now. <laughs> we are celebrating Him. I so thank God for the language of Scripture. It might be foreign to our ear in its Aramaic or Hebrew or Greek form, but it remains mother tongue language when our hearts hear living epistle talk. Because this is not the kind of fellowship where some are in and some are out the most inclusive conversation that you could ever engage in and I dare you communicate his love when you look into the next person's eye and find testimony there of him grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of the gift of Christ you know how gift language disarms reward language. <laughs> reward is so exclusive. I thank God for His gifts wrapped up in you. How rich we are in one another. How blessed we are in one another. What a place to discover fellowship. This goes beyond building, beyond denomination. Thank God for society and its many different expressions. But we are participating in a fellowship that will ignite a new definition to society. Is the nation shall come to your life and their kings to the brightness of your rising. I was sharing in a church the other day in Johannesburg and uh, I knew they had like a prophetic ministry just before I was there the previous week and said, I've, I've, got, a, I've got a prophetic word for you. And they all like sat up and got their pins up. I said to them, the future is bright. Because the true light that enlightens every man has come. <laughs> We're not going to run out of light on this one. Say, Oops, sorry. You're last in the queue. <laughs> come again next year. <laughs> the king shall come. I've just been blessed by a friend of mine with a little book by um, Billy Graham's grandson, Julian. And um, I'm not familiar with his, the pronunciation of his second name yet. Be practicing because it's such a brilliant book. And his statement on the cover says, Inexhaustible grace to an exhausted world. You see, we're not here sharing a few new thoughts on how to improve your lifestyle. We're talking salvation language here. There are multitudes in the gutter multitudes of people who have given up hope they have no reference to a brighter future but guess what you are the light of the world God says sees enough light in you to see you as his strategy for planet earth 
You see, we're not talking about an inpouring. It's all about an outpouring. Because out of your innermost being will gush rivers of living water. <laughs> Tony, what does that scripture you read this morning from Genesis about the river from Eden? Yeah. It does too. <laughs> oh my my. So our fellowship, our kunania, is so simple, but it's so profound. It is simply acknowledging every good thing. We've been distracted for so long, acknowledging every bad thing that's happened to us. So we've compared notes and we've found our little pity party fellowships there. They are great, but they're not great enough to redeem society. Because we have a different reference. And it comes from the mouth of God. Who calls things which are not. <laughs> because they are. <laughs> of God's doing are we in Christ. Not of our own doing. Whom God made to be our wisdom. And this wisdom unveils how righteous, how innocent. How holy. How redeemed. You are. Because the man who finds the treasure goes away and he sells all he has and he buys the entire field. He buys the entire field. You see, God doesn't need to swear by himself to kind of, you know, motivate himself about you. <laughs> he speaks our language, says Hebrews chapter 6, to bring an end to all dispute. There is no contradiction that has what it takes. To engage in enough dispute to question the integrity of God's original idea wrapped up in you. You have no excuse to participate in anything less than what you are redeemed to enjoy. Every high place. 700 years before it happens, Isaiah declares God's plan. Every high place, every hill, every valley, every crooked place, even the rough place, made smooth. Mm -hmm. There is no excuse <laughs> that we could ever gather to justify distance when He has embraced us in oneness. He has come to tabernacle in us. <laughs> the eternal address of God has found a home in you. He didn't come with an overnight bag to visit for the weekend. <laughs> Moved in lock, stock and barrel. <laughs> He's here to stay. And our fellowship is simply to acknowledge every good thing that is in us. How, how dare we think it? Because as He is, so are we. What is true of Him is equally true of us. Grace was given to each one of us according to the same measure. I mean, we go from South Africa to America and we've got to stop thinking of, in metric language because it's back to miles here. <laughs> I won't labor the point. <laughs> But there is a measure. And the Hebrew, the root word Messiah, Messiah, Meshach, means measure. And Christos, hence on the word Geir, hand. You also measure your horses by the old age, old original measure. Seventeen hand horse. There is a measure that needs no adjustment. And grace was given to each one of us according to that measure. We can never again underestimate ourselves. Which is what unbelief is all about. Unbelief has no further definition but to believe a lie about you and one another.
Israel died in the wilderness. Not because of an inferior salvation from Pharaoh. But because they embraced the idea that there are giants out there. Not realizing that there was not one man out there not equally defeated in Pharaoh's defeat. Whatever giant we come up in our illusions doesn't have what it takes to defeat God's destiny and His purpose for your life. So let's engage in a fellowship that ignites our hearts. We are so privileged to participate in Paul's understanding of the metanoia moment. From now on, therefore. This has nothing to do with a I'm going to make a quality decision to be more polite towards my neighbor. This is a moment that redefines everything. He says in the next verse, that's 2 Corinthians 5.16, in the next verse he says, Behold, everything has become new. You see, the therefore has a reference that carries more authority than everything else. Doesn't matter how many years, you know, we have plowed the fields, the same field, harvested the same harvest, the same crop, eating the same bread. We are not designed to survive by bread alone. Right. But there's another bread. <laughs> and he's come to exp ex express that. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. <laughs> My angel, oh, hallelujah. I so love it when Lydia tours with me. She helps me remember, but then we run out of time. What is our time? How many times? Just, just wa wave when you need to stop. Um, this little doll so helps us understand what is hidden within us. Just as a reference, as a point of contact, when Peter begins his writing in Second Peter 1, he says that um, we have received a faith of equal standing. And I'm just so persuaded in my heart that the equal standing that each one of us participate in has got absolutely nothing to do with our belief. But it has everything to do with a faith that we have received. Because Peter defines that. He says, through, dear, through the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So through what God accomplished in Christ Jesus, God communicates His belief. Now our belief could never compete with His. That's why Paul reduces faith down to one faith in Ephesians 4. He says there is only one valid faith. And as we begin to discover the unfolding of His faith, His faith points us to every good thing that we participate in. It's the koinonia of our faith that ignites within our hearts. And we realize it's all there. And in the context of contradiction, what we are gifted with does not suddenly go into evaporation mode. Do I have ten minutes? Huh? Ten minutes. I so enjoyed Peter. I've just sat with the first, um, first Peter chapter 1 this last week and it's so wonderful to find a, a language that continues to endorse the same thought the same knowing the same authentic knowing we've received a, a faith of equal standing through his doing he has graced us with exactly the same reference to what is always known to be true about us. So we don't have to waste another moment trying to persuade God to overcome His reluctance to think differently about us. Let's just engage in the adventure, the, the absolute adventure of discovering Christ in us. His desire is, in verse 2, I'm reading from the mirror, God's desire is that we may now increasingly be overwhelmed with grace 
as His divine influence within us and become fully acquainted with the awareness of our oneness. The way He has always known us is realized in Jesus our Master. We've read it in most translations through the knowledge of Him. And again, we have made the knowledge of Him, our knowledge of Him, our interpretation of God. And yet Jesus comes and He overwhelms us with God's knowledge of us. Yeah. Hey, 1, John, 1 Corinthians 13, 12, so that we may know even as we have always been known. <laughs> we have forgotten what manner of people we are, but He has not. So His grace language is to overwhelm us with this knowledge of us in the most dynamic dimension. Increasingly so. And in verse 3, by His divine engineering, He gifted us with all that it takes to live life to the full. Where our ordinary, day-to-day -day lives mirror our devotion and romance with our Maker. His intimate knowledge of us introduces us to ourselves again and elevates us to a position where His original intention is clearly perceived. He gifted us. Did you hear that language again? With all that it takes to live life to the full. For several years I struggled with um, verse 5 of 2 Peter 1 because in most of our translations it says now add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge and immediately the, the old law mind um, was activated again. So, okay, you've been given a faith of equal standing. But it's going to take some effort to add to it. But I love the Greek language and um, there's a lovely word here that the Baxter will appreciate because the word that we've translated add to carries three components. <coughs> Epichoregeo. The same perichoresis of, of your ministry. The same chorus or dance wrapped up in that word you know we we come from a, a very um, amazing uh, part of the planet we have some, some friends that are brilliant winemakers and um, so we enjoy our red wines in in the Western Cape and uh, we were we were having a meal just the other day at one of the local wine farms and we had a lady just introducing us you know doing some wine tasting and and it was so amazing was to participate in someone who understands the nuances and the and the subtleties in this in this moment and they would encourage you you know when you when you take a sip of this wine and just roll it in your mouth to to detect through association not that which distracts from the wine but that which reinforces the moment Did you taste the guava i remember we were there with andre and mary ann and mary ann said so the, you guys put guava in your wine? <laughs> That's what I love about language, you know, how one could engage with language and put it under the microscope and discover subtleties that just help us understand. Because He has come to give us understanding, to know Him who is true. And we know Him who is true, what happens to us? We discover that we are right there in Him. Who is true? So the word that we've translated add to is actually the word epi chore geo in the Greek. Epi is a preposition that, that has the idea of continual influence, almost like a teacher standing in front of a class and, and teaches. And there's a continual influence. And, and then the next word choros, where we get the word chorus from. It's a dance or a choir or an orchestra. And then the next little word, the third little one, ag agul, to lead often to lead as a shepherd leads his sheep. You see the picture of a choir conductor? And just suddenly Peter says, but you know, he's, he's gifted us with all that it takes to live life to the full. Now be the choir conductor of your own life. Begin to discover what he has wrapped up in your skin, in your being, because you will be overwhelmed 
with not only what he has in you, but what he has in your husband, <laughs> in your wife, in your children, in your enemies. <laughs> because we are talking about a koinonia that ignites when we acknowledge, not question, acknowledge every good thing that is in us, in him, to begin with. And verse 4 speaks about making all, um, every effort. This is exactly what God always had in mind for us. Every one of us of His abundant and priceless promises pointed to our restored participation in our godly origin. Every one of His priceless promises pointed us to a restored participation, koinonia, in our divine origin. Because we began in Him. We are His idea. And now He says, um, Verse 5, now, in the light of what we are gifted with in Christ, the stage is set to display life's excellence. Explore the adventure of faith. Imagine the extreme dedication and focus of a conductor of music. How he would diligently acquaint himself with every individual voice in the choir, as well as the contribution of every specific instrument to follow the precise sound represented in every single note in order to give maximum credit to the original composition. You see what we're talking about here? He says an original composition. And as we engage, we are blessed with our younger son, who is a classical pianist, you know. And we never told Stefan to go and practice music or go and play music. We'd wake up in the mornings when he still lived with us, hearing the piano. You see, this diligence is not some kind of diligence that you have to grab yourself by the scruff of the neck. Read your Bible, pray every day. What a poor substitute to romance. But our hearts are overwhelmed to engage with him and allow him to just ignite our hearts in a participation in our divine origin. Okay, I'm not going to labor any of the points here. I just want to point out a few things. You that uh, follow the precise sound, represent every single note in order to give maximum credit to the original composition. This is exactly what it means to exhibit the divine character. You are the choir conductor of your own life. Study the full content of faith. Discover in faith how elevated you are and from in and from this position your co-seatedness in christ new understanding will dawn in you now let me just help you with this word we have translated the word iro with the word virtue now the word virtue can mean many things but iro has in its uh, root meaning the idea of elevation in john 15 where, where jesus speaks about the father being the vine dresser you know, we've, we, we've, we've read, he, he comes to cut every branch that does not bear fruit. And the word is the exact same word, that he lifts it up. You ask a vine dresser what you do. You leave the branch on the, on the floor, it's going to rot. But he lifts it up, he elevates it. And so you see, faith immediately brings us to an understanding of how elevated we are. Because we're not talking the fall of Adam language anymore. We're talking a language that sees us elevated, co-seated together with Christ. When Paul begins Ephesians 1, he prays that the eyes of our understanding will be flooded with light. To see what? To see how glorified Jesus is. God is seated Him far above every possible definition of competition. And then in the next chapter he says, And while we were still dead in our trespasses, long before we knew about this, we were co-quickened. We were made alive together with Christ. Remember talking God's faith here. We're not trying to compare our faith and our ideas with His. We're just allowing His faith to overwhelm us so that we can acknowledge something that ignites. How elevated you are. He seated us together with Christ. In heavenly places. You cannot get any higher than that. We might go into Corinthians where Paul speaks about the thorn in the flesh. Maybe in the next session. But there is no contradiction that has what it takes. To get you less elevated than what you already are. You might not every day feel equally elevated. But we're not talking about how you know and what you feel. Right. We're de declaring what He knows about you. Remember? Because if your fellowship is simply the communication of how miserable you feel today, you're going to find that communication to be your reference. But you have a bigger reference. And remember, we're not talking about nice ideas to just elevate your life a little. This is, this is salvation language. Because here we are, light of the world, beaming an answer 
desperate, desperate world. <laughs> the very first thing that faith unfolds is that we are equally elevated in Christ. There is an elevation that we participate in. And in this elevation, in our co-seatedness, a new kind of knowledge impacts our understanding. By faith we understand, says Hebrews chapter 11. By faith we understand that the world were framed. This is, no, this is not just some kind of academic conclusion. But this is an unveiling of a joint position. And in that place, discover your spiritual strength. The strength that He demonstrated in Christ when He raised Him from the dead. And suddenly there's a reference to the strength within you. Why? Because you're going to need it. <laughs> we tell about our first Land Rover that my father bought. We got stuck in a dangerous place. We had to cross the lagoon and there was the tide coming in on that side and this, the vehicle was stuck. And, and it's our first Land Rover and we're pushing and pulling and trying to get this thing unstuck. And thank God there was a gentleman who knew more about 4x4 four four than what we did at that stage. And he walked by offering his help and as he looked into the cabin he noticed that the gear lever was not engaged. And all he did was engage the gear lever. And a very dangerous moment became our first adventure in a 4x4 four four vehicle. <laughs> but all it took was not more muscle, but just an understanding of what we've got. Engage your thoughts, says Paul in Colossians 3. Since you are co-raised co together with Christ, relocate yourself mentally. And you can do it in one moment. Amen. If you can breathe a breath, you can think a thought. Amen. Engage your thoughts. Engage your thoughts with throne room realities. And in that moment of engaging, I discover a place of spiritual strength. <laughs> Kavar moment, mounting up with wings of an eagle. Running, doing the very thing that exhausted me yesterday. I'm not tired, don't faint. Doing these things, Peter says, we don't have time to conclude all of that. Maybe we next session we will just continue a bit with that. Just, just tell me, do I have one minute, two minutes? In South Africa, they hold up little signs, five minutes. You come in for a quick landing. Okay, so here we've got these guys. All right, you just leave them there. Oh, hallelujah. And in this place of spiritual strength. You see, you're not going to discover the spiritual strength if you don't realize that it is yours by faith, by the faith of God, by God's belief. And it's yours because you are equally seated together with Christ. You're equally elevated. You're equally elevated. <laughs> Isn't that enough to go get, get, get our minds into soaring mode? Equally elevated we are. We don't have to flap our wings to gain altitude. <laughs> and this knowledge becomes the very fuel of koinonia. And Paul speaks about his own ministry and people gossiped a bit about him, you know, and said that his bodily presence was rather in, you know, inferior. You know, he writes this wonderful stuff, but he, Paul says, I may be unskilled in speaking, but I'm not so in knowledge. You see, the secret of Paul's ministry was not to compare his eloquence with, um, who was the other guy, Apollos. But the source that we speak from, it might find a stuttering tongue in your mouth. But the source is pure. It is the knowledge that we engage in. That unlocks spiritual strength. And the next one it does is endurance. This is not just a flash in the pan moment of energy. It is a place of endurance. It beats willpower. The strongest man can lift such a high... Maybe wait, but only for a moment until his knees buckle again. And in that place of endurance, I discover, I'm going to see if I've got the right man. In the place of endurance, I discover, there's the one, there's endurance. And in the place of endurance, I discover true devotion. That's where true worship ignites. <laughs> in faith. <laughs> in what faith knows to be true about you. In prison, Paul and Silas and say, well, We've got reason to uh, just sing some nice quiet songs just to encourage one another. They burst out in praise. And in that place of worship we discover brotherly affection. <laughs> we may say beautiful things about him, says James. James 3 verse 9. Decorate God with our conversation. And look up and see someone that really irritates us. What's the use of saying nice things about him, cursing a man made in his image? 
And in this brotherly affection, we discover the heart of it all, the agape of God. The agape ignites faith. Faith doesn't work any other way. Willpower just cannot do it. Father, I thank you for all that you have wrapped up in us, in one another. Thank you for this place of fellowship where we are just mutually embraced in a conversation began in heaven. We are your idea. We salute your idea wrapped up in our skin. We thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.